the Norman Fulham uh, on a global star party, uh, one hosted by uh, Scott Roberts at Explorer Scientific. These are star parties that have hosts and many thousands of people log into these on average of about 6,000, one had 19,000 uh, recently. And uh, about a month ago on one of the global star parties where I was one of the hosts, uh, Norman Fulham was a guest speaker. And uh, Norman uh, lives in Verdry Dorion, a suburb of Montreal in Quebec. Um, and during the course of the program, he told his life story in such an honest and interesting and personal way that I was just totally blown away. So I'm not going to ruin it by telling a story in advance. I'm going to let him do it a little bit later. Um, I will tell you that um, he owns and operates a company called Optiques Fulham. And they make telescopes and telescope mirrors. And could I share a screen for a moment, Tony? Uh, yes. All right, authorized? Should be ready to go. Okay. Um, all right, let's see here if I can get to it. There is one of the small telescopes that he makes. This is off of his website. Can you see that, Tony? Um, no, uh, you have to, I believe you have to do something here. Um, you, yeah, have you, have to, you have to click the share screen. Yeah, you have to click your share screen. Bottom tray. Okay, there, I did it, I did it. There, there we go. Is. There's one of the small telescopes he makes, a 50 inch <laughs> daub. Um, so we're talking about that 25 inch uh, down in Boone County, he could use that as a finder. Um, so this is uh, an extraordinary uh, gentleman. I'm going to leave, stop sharing screen now and just tell you that he is a, a fascinating and friendly individual, uh, a good singer, I might add, and uh, a very, very talented man. And I'm really pleased to have him with us tonight. Norman Fulham. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Chuck. Uh, I don't know if I, um, you see what I see right now. You see me. I'm on my phone right now because uh, what I wanted to do is uh, do a walk around in my shop to start with, with my phone in my hand. And um, just a quick walk around the shop, show you what I have here, uh, the, the, um, the tools that I'm working with and uh, very quickly. And then I come back and then log out and come back and log in on my laptop and then I can do the presentation. Uh, that way you'll have an idea what's, what's it's in here. And then uh, I will tell you the story what was before that happened here. <laughs> Is that okay? Um, I'm gonna try to um, change side of the uh, camera. Let me see how I can, I can do this. Uh, I think, uh, how do they do? How can I change the side of my camera? Anybody knows how? <laughs> yeah, let's see. If it's an I, iPhone, there should be an icon when you're in video that looks like a uh, um, a circle with an arrow. No, it's not an iPhone. Oh, OK. I can't help you out. I'm sorry. Let's on, see. An, on an Android, there's an icon at the top left if you have an Android. Shoot. I succeeded with Scott the last time. He said, hit, hit the screen a few times and it worked. Mitch is yeah. timing. Hold on. Mitch, do you have an idea or were you just saying hit the phone? Hang on, let me unmute Mitch so he can explain. Yeah. Mitch, you're muted. Okay, Mitch, if you unmute, you can explain. There you go. Yes, on, on the Android phones at the very bottom, on the bottom, on the right, there is a icon of a camera with circles in it. That will reverse your camera. Of course, this isn't in Zoom. Hang on. Ha! On a Samsung, it's in the top left. 
but that's not that's not zoom well you could always turn your phone around the other way and walk walk that way yeah but then he can't see what he's then he can't see what you're seeing right? oh that's true that's true we may have just okay i'm letting him back in he may have uh reset his phone <clears throat> Okay, I'm back. Hi. Hi again, sorry, I made a mistake. <laughs> okay, uh, where do I go for change of site? I don't know, Dot. I should have tried it before we, we go on. Mitch, did you wanna restate your suggestion? Well, this is, this is Mitch, but... Uh... I have a feeling you're in the Zoom app on your phone, and it's probably different than uh, the camera on the phone. So, okay. so I don't really have anything to add because I don't have the Zoom app on my Android phone. Okay. Let's see. There's a plus here. Uh, go to the bottom. Then it shows a, a picture of a camera at the top left for rotate. Yeah. That's the yeah. Zoom. Well, maybe I'll have to do the, the other way, and um, I'm going to try to to aim the telephone properly. I don't know. I'll do my best. Is that okay? Sure. Or you could just stand in front of whatever it is you want to, with your back to whatever yeah. you want to talk at. Yeah. Okay. So I will show you what the first section of the, of the shop here. I'm going around around here like this. So this is the side where all my grinding machine and polishing machine are. Um, you will have on this side here, on the right side, the small machine that I built. All my, my all the equipment I built myself over the years. Over here, this is one grinding machine. This is another grinding <laughs> machine with a, with a small 40 inch mirror on top of it. Uh, on the other side, there's another one here with the 37 inch uh, mirror on it. Um, there's another one here, different one with the solid mirror, 25 inch, uh, small eight inch for new moon telescopes here. Um, and then the, I built a very large machine to make the very large mirror for up to 65 inch diameters. And on it right now, there's a 48 inch uh, mirror on the grinding machine and polishing. Well, actually, we're starting the polishing right now this week. It's going to be the mirror, the replacement mirror for the Great Melbourne Telescope in Australia. It's a historical telescope that was built in uh, 1886 that uh, was destroyed in a uh, bushfire in, uh, in Mont Tremblant in, in late 2000, early 2000, and uh, the mirror had melted. So uh, they, they were looking to rebuild the historical telescope at the museum and they needed a new optics. So uh, I'm making the, the primary and secondary mirror for that telescope. So on the side here, it's all mirror, grinding, polishing, measuring. There's a, the, the big long tunnel for testing here, the dark tunnel for uh, call testing on this side. This side here is for the very large mirror and the other one with the tarp, black tarp here is for the smaller mirror to about 25 inches. So this is the, the side where the optic is done. So uh, you have to be very careful not to hit too <laughs> the mirror when we walk around. <laughs> so on the other side here, it's more the uh, composant uh, structure of the telescope and the, the making of the, of the, the mirror blank themselves. Uh, See this baby here is um, exactly the same telescope that uh, uh, Chuck just showed you uh, the picture of. It's 36 inch F3.5 folded Newtonian that I'm building right now for the Astrolab of uh, Megantic Observatory in Canada. So uh, right now the structure is all pretty much assembled for the first assembling. Uh, it's not painted yet. Uh, the mirror is not in yeah, but the mirror is done. It's finished, ready to be coated. You can see the uh, the floating cell and the air support, and it's already moving on uh, on its own bearings 
the, uh, the motorization will be installed shortly. So this is uh, the project I'm working on right now, most of the time this week. At the back of the shop here on this side, there's a small vacuum chamber for small mirror up to 22 inches diameters, homemade also. So this is uh, the small vacuum chamber. If I turn around here on the other side of this section here, oh, there's another 40 inch here, right there. What, what is it doing here? <laughs> it's a 40 inch F3 prime focus uh, is gonna go for a Hercules telescope uh, very shortly. It's gonna have to be coated first. And the back side here, if you look at this big baby here, this is a kiln, big kiln for, uh, to, to, to make my mirror, to fuse my mirror. I will, with, uh, later on in the presentation, I will show you what techno fusion mirror are that I created with the, the help of Laval University. So this is a kiln. I will open the kiln for you. I have a small 30 inch in it right now. So if you look inside the kiln here, there's a, there's a 30 inch blank that's all just finished to be uh, fused together. So I can do up to about 100 inch in that kiln if I wanted to. I never done it yet, but I eventually probably will do it. Um, and over here, well, it's uh, another large uh, vacuum chamber that I can do up to 65 inch because I wanted to, to be able to coat the mirror that I can make up to 65 inch so I can, be, I can do the coating right here. I will show you again in the presentation later on how it was built. This mirror here is a 36 inch F2.5 that's going to go in the structure what we saw earlier for the Astrolab in Megantic. This is waiting next to the vacuum chamber to be coated this week. So, and there's another, oh, look, another 40 inch waiting here to be grinded. So, a lot of work. Uh, the pandemic didn't stop me much uh, in my work so far um, because uh, dif uh, differently from other telescope maker, I don't do fast moving telescope. It's always uh, custom made. And um, most of the time it takes about between eight months to a year and a half to build either the scope or just the mirror. So uh, it's a, always a long-term project. So I'm gonna go back in the office and then I will do a, a better presentation, hopefully, than what we can see here. I'll be going to the office, going through the mirrors. There we go. Okay, so this is the offices, music chamber, <laughs> and the office. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna log out and then log in with my laptop and I will do the, the presentation. Is that all right? That Perfect. is just fine. Okay, I'll be right back. Scott, that 80 inch may be in our future. Scott, you're muted. Yeah, that's a good idea. Now we just got to find a place to put it. <laughs> Like to have a shop like that? Yeah, I'd like to do that instead of what I do now. Well, wait to hear a story. Yeah, I don't know if I could build all that equipment. <laughs> you can get it just all DOD surplus. <laughs> Wonder what he does about dust. It didn't look like he had. Dirty area separated from the clean areas. Ask, ask him. Ask him. Yeah, I'll have to ask him about that. Maybe right, they I'll don't have dust in Montreal. Them. Maybe that's just a <laughs> dust layer. Sorry. Okay. There we go. You're unmuted, ready to go. Hold on, I have to enlarge my image here. Okay, there we go. Okay, I'm here. <laughs> Hello again. I hope it wasn't too. Um, too hard to see with the, I couldn't see, I couldn't see what I was showing. <laughs> it was perfect. It was okay. Yeah, the great. Okay, so what I've got to tell you here is a little story. Um, 
of uh, how it all started, what it be, how it became what it is today. Um, to start with, I think it goes back about 55 years ago. Uh, I was seven, eight years old, and um, we lived in the east side of Montreal, and uh, we had a neighbor uh, that had a telescope. And uh, once in a while, he would invite us over it and look at the moon and the planets. And I was so amazed by what I was seeing that I, it stayed there since uh, over the years. I always liked astronomy. I always kept track of what was going on in the sky. And um, when I was in middle school, uh, my dream was not to be a telescope maker or anything. It was a biologist. I loved that biology. I had microscope already then in those years and always liked uh, observing uh, microbes and stuff. But um, eventually, at the age of about 10, 12 years old, my brother, older brother, which is his birthday today, he would have been 65 today, but he's passed away many, many years ago. Uh, he was a guitar player and uh, he was a classical guitar player. And um, he kind of gave me the the... the the, 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 the will to play guitar and uh, I did never learn music or anything else but just by watching him I learned to play guitar and the finger style picking and then the classical the techniques and everything but it, I've always been a guitar player since about 10, 11 years old and uh, unfortunately music in those years when you're a teenager it's, it's fairly great to have a rock band <laughs> when you get into uh, grade, uh, I don't know, 12, 11, uh, the, the, the girls are like the musicians and uh, the rock bands are very popular in school. So that was my downfall because uh, music and band, rock bands in those years uh, brought me to uh, substance abuse and uh, alcohol abuse in the early age, early stage of my life. And... Uh, I didn't know at that time, the, the, those years, and um, all, all the way to up to about the age of um, 18, 19 years old, I was playing in bands, we traveled around, uh, went to Vancouver and the west uh, west side of, of the country, we lived there for a while, and then one, at one point one of the musicians in the band died in a car crash, the band split, but anyway, to make a, a long story short of that very dark era in my life, which I don't regret, but I mean, it's uh, it's part of my life. Um, it's uh, it kind of gave me. Um, I was sad because I couldn't live my dream uh, to be a musician at some point. And when um, I came back to, to to Montreal without a band, without music, and then uh, <laughs> would you believe that I started to work for Brinks Canada? <laughs> <laughs> my father was at a, a plug to to get me a job and then I worked for uh, for Brinks for uh, two three years uh, in the armor trucks with a gun and everything that was pretty weird and um, at one point the company had to uh, lay off some uh, the, the uh, some some employees so I was one of the last the last employee to get in so I was laid off so I ended up at about 23 24 years old no job. And um, I said, okay, I'm going to go back out west just for a trip. The heck of it, because I had a good time over there, and I didn't have anything holding me back in, in Montreal. So uh, I, I took the train all the way to Edmonton, and then I decided to hitchhike across the Rockies uh, just for a trip of it. So from Edmonton to Jasper, I caught a, I caught a ride from, with um, a, a cook in a big hotel resort. And uh, he said, well, we're always looking for uh, bartenders or uh, waiters at the hotel. So if you want to work there, you, you're welcome. There's a staff house. So I stayed there for three years. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, I worked all the, 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 the places in Jasper. It was a great place and actually got me in contact with nature in the night sky a lot. Uh, I don't know if you know, uh, in the Rockies, the, the night skies are unbelievable. And uh, it reminded me astronomy i always liked it so i i kind of re reconnect with the uh, with the sky traveled around after that in the west and then um, at one point my father was really sick and i had cancer so i decided to go back to montreal for for the the few months that he had for the uh, to live and um when i came back 
uh, I had to find a job for the few months that I was there. So I ended up having a, con a kitchen concession right downtown Montreal. And that's where I met my wife. She was one of my customers. So I met my wife and um, never went back west. Uh, I stayed in, in, uh, in, um, in Montreal with her over the years. And then we moved uh, in the country in, uh, in Quebec. And I still had uh, that alcohol problem, though, and drugs uh, problem. And but when my, our first son was born, I t took the decision to quit everything, alcohol and drugs and everything. And uh, today, uh, next January is going to be 30 years now that I'm a, I'm clean and alcohol free and drug free. So I'm uh, 30 years um, clean. And when we bought a house in the Hudson near Montreal uh, after, right after that, that I quit everything. And a uh, second son was born and um, I got a job as a color match. I was doing matching color for car paint uh, for about when, I, when we moved. And then that was for about 10, over 10 years that I worked there. But in the meantime, I was working there the house that we had bought, it was outside of Montreal, so night sky was great, and there was a comet, I don't remember, I think it's Kuhutek, I don't remember exactly which one it was at that those days, uh, that was uh, very popular, people were talking about it, and then uh, one, we, I went to a garage sale, and there was a guy that was selling a small Tasco two and a half inch telescope, I said, hey, I'm going to buy it, just for fun of it, and I did observe that small Tesco telescope for a while, uh, looking at the, plage, uh, the moon and stuff, I said, well, maybe it's time to, to buy a telescope. So there's a place in Montreal called uh, La Maison de l'Astronomie. Go there. And uh, I knew that I, I didn't want a small telescope. I wanted something decent. And it was way too expensive for, my, for my, the money that I had. Uh, a new house took two young kids, my wife wasn't working, so I was delivering pizza at night also to just to make ends meet. So uh, it took a while to to say, well, what should I do? I, I wanted a telescope. So, but what the, the salesman at the store said, well, why don't you buy this book here? And uh, they show you how to make a mirror and how to build a telescope. I said, okay, so I bought the book, read the book about four times. <laughs> Make sure that I understand what it was, what was involved in the making of the telescope, the grinding and polishing of the mirror, and I, I asked my wife, can we? Because in those days, just to buy the, the the material to make it, I wanted to make a twelve and a half inch mirror. It came up to about four or five hundred dollar material, the the blanks and the all the abrasive and all the kit that I needed. So with, she said, okay, you can do it, but. Uh, Make sure you don't mess it up. So it took about a, nine months to grind the first, uh, my first mirror, a 12 and a half inch F7, 7.1 primary mirror. And uh, I really liked the experience. It was pretty, pretty weird uh, for me to start with, with a, a table, a barrel and go around the barrel outside in the, in the summertime and then uh, in the house when uh, it got cold. And when I finally got to the point of polishing and then you, I could do the, the measurement while well, I had to build my, my first Foucault tester. And when you don't know what exactly it is, I go, well, that in those days, um, internet was just starting. I mean, it was just, there was no Google, there was no information so easy available that we have today. So I, I contacted a couple of, of astronomy club in the area here, and I asked them, do you know how to operate the Foucault tester? I don't have no idea. So they didn't have any idea either. So it took me about a month to figure it out, build my own Foucault tester, and then start to do my testing. And I was doing that in the house, 12 and a half inch F7. It's a long, you need uh, almost 15 feet long uh, apartment to, to do the measurement. So we have a very small house. I was doing the I was in the kitchen with the Foucault tester and the mirror was in the living room and the kids had to stop moving while I was doing the measurement because he was moving the score. It was, <laughs> it was something. So finished the mirror and but so I have a mirror, but I didn't have a scope. So uh, 
I bought another book on how to build a trust tube telescope out of plywood and pretty much uh, the, the basic uh, uh, Newtonian telescope to build. And uh, I built it. And then I really, really, really liked what I saw the first time I, I observed. I observed uh, was the moon, of course, the, the first thing that you want to observe when you have a first telescope, and it was there. I was blown away, but I was, I was able to see. And then from that point on, my telescope was in the backyard. I had no observatory. I had a tarp. And the first year that I had that telescope, it was a tarp on uh, uh, winter or summertime. I would just move the tarp off, observe for the for a few hours, then put the tarp or sn uh, shovel the snow around the telescope and then just observe. It was my really, uh, I was passionate about it. And doing that also, I convinced my younger, my older son that he needed a telescope too. I mean, uh, the, the telescope I had built was very high up, the seven, F7. You had to climb up the ladder about, uh, I don't know, six feet up. And then that night, my, my wife didn't like that. So I said, OK, we're going to build him a small telescope. So I had the, 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 the house that we had bought. The guy that lived there before was a woodworker. So in the shed, he had left all kinds of wood. So I decided, well, why don't I don't do a, a tube out of wood? So I took the, I didn't know how to work wood. So I bought books again, how to work the woods, <laughs> how to, to glue and how to finish the wood. So I finished the first wooden telescope. Uh, it was a, a seven inch F 4.5. And um, the, 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 the result was very nice. Uh, I liked it a lot. And um, at that point, point, uh, the, the people of the um, as astronomy club around knew, started to, to, to learn that I was making mirror, polishing mirror by hand, and that I had built a very nice, beautiful uh, wooden telescope. So I said, they asked me, so why don't you bring it to Stellafane? What's Stellafane? It's Stellafane is the yearly event in, the, in the Vermont that, for the uh, amateur telescope maker to, to go and present the telescope and get awards for a uh, the quality of your work and that year I wanted to go but I was working the weekend of the Stella fan so they took it he said we're gonna take the telescope bring it over there and present it for you I said, sure fine go ahead so they took the telescope there and then uh, they called me up on Saturday night say hey Norm you won first place award for craftsmanship no way really so I was okay <laughs> I must have done something right so that gave me kind of a, of a boost to say, well, maybe I should build another one just for the heck of it. So I built an eight inch F5 uh, for the third telescope. And then um, the people are starting to, to ask me, can you do a mirror for me? Can you do a mirror for me? Or can you refigure a mirror for me? Because uh, sometimes the, the optics wasn't that good. So that's how I really started to to get into the making of, of the, um, uh, not the basic of my company, but how I got involved into so many projects at the same time. I was working full time, delivering pizza at night, and doing optics at, in the weekends and when I have minutes. And then at one point, I said to my wife, I "said Maybe I should do it full time. Maybe I, it could be uh, my my work to build telescope." I said, "Well, okay, you, you're good at it, but you don't have any idea how to start a business." Uh, that, and I was true. I mean, I didn't I never own a business, or I didn't know how to run a business. So I said, I, I, I said, I told her, I said, what if I take some lessons, some courses? So I said, yeah, sure, take some courses, and if you do, then why not? Let's try it. So I took two years of uh, nights lessons uh, here in in the, in the, at the city hall. Here they were giving lessons on how to start businesses, one night a week, sometimes twice, and then after two years. I was starting to get a lot of uh, people interested in my work, and then I was ready. So I quit my job and jumped, and I rented my first uh, shop. It was in this one here. It was uh, in Hudson. Very, very small. I had uh, about 800 square feet, which was much better than what I had at home. In my basement, I only had about 200 square feet. <laughs> so it was it was a very, very large uh, shop for me to start with. And while I'm 
to keep going that presentation, I would like to share my screen. I have a presentation that I had done for uh, the Real Astronomy uh, Society of Canada uh, a few years back, and it, it will show you a picture and all everything went to this point here now. So if you don't mind me sharing the, the, the screen, is that okay? Yes, go ahead. Hold on here. Uh, I will go share screen. Uh, do, 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 do. If I go, no, it will be, no, hold on. I have to go this here first. No. Share screen and then go here. Uh, if I close this, I go. Mm -hmm. oh, la, la. Desktop. Uh, should be that's the cell extreme. Hold on, I'll be right there. Do you see this? Uh, not yet, sometimes it takes a few seconds. Okay. Do you see? No. So no. Um, did you do share screen? Yeah. And then you'll have to full size your image of your whatever PowerPoint or whatever you have going on. Okay, hold on. Firefox. Mm -hmm. Exit minimize. Okay, there we go. Share screen. Okay. No, that's not it. Uh, PowerPoint. Do you see that? Not yet. No Not sure. yet. Share screen. How about now? No. No. It's a PowerPoint. Uh, Share. Okay, oh. here it comes. Okay, there we go. This here? Uh, it is loading now. Yes, we see a, a whole yes. bunch. There we go. We've got there we go. Now. Okay, okay. So that that's a, a PowerPoint presentation that I have done for the Royal Astronomy Society of Canada. And the, the presentation starts when I was making wooden telescope. Um, what picture that you see at the, at the beginning here, or picture taken with some of my telescope in Australia uh, by Anthony Wesley here, just to, I have to, uh, you know, <laughs> give me a good, a good hand here. <laughs> okay, so here, here it is. You probably recognize the site. It's telephone. Oh, it's telephone. So the telescope that you see there is the remake of my first telescope. Uh, the first telescope, the 12 and a half inch F7.1. It was made of plywood and trust tube and very, very basic. And that after a few years, it was falling apart. <laughs> so I decided to rebuild, keep the mirrors and rebuild the telescope around it. So uh, this is the telescope made of a uh, Coco Bolo tel uh, wood. This type of, of telescope that I was building then, it was all handmade and carved optics handmade also. So this telescope is one of my prettiest that I've done so far, I think. Um, it's a guy in uh, British Columbia that owns it now. He's, um, uh, he lives in Osoyo Valley. He has a huge observatory and the telescope is living in this living room bay window looking to the valley. So he, ne he never see the nice sky, unfortunately, but it's his baby. So Stellafane was the big uh, part of my um, 
beginning uh, challenge that it, it gave me the challenge uh, to improve my my techniques my uh, my optics also and as you can see here different type of telescope that I built over the years um, like this one here it's a 10 inch Stella Fang gave me um, the, the, the confidence that I needed to keep going because they were over the years that I, I was presenting telescope there I've got seven first place award and a few second place and third place and honorable awards so they really recognize my my work and that kept me going even though it sometimes was pretty hard hard time for the business but because like, like, I, like I say and you can see my telescope or not telescope that you would see in a store to, or a Costco or a Canadian Tire or whatever it's like it's all custom made and um, for the customer I mean you, you you give you me your order and I build it so this is another one uh, with all the the um, astronomical sign of the planet hand carved on the on the OTA with a comet hand carved here and a galaxy see lots lots of work for uh, each telescope and all the telescope has the man in the moon uh, altitude bearing hand carved for for all uh, for this on both sides so it's very some people call them the Harry Potter telescope or Jules Verne telescopes <laughs> So, and um, at one point I got a phone call by uh, uh, Alan Treno I don't know if you know Alan Treno he was one of the organizer of um, NEF Northeast Astronomy Forum uh, the yearly uh, exhibition show in uh, in New York he was the first to invite me over there because he had heard about my, my work and said why don't you come to NEF and present your telescope there it will, I think you will be a, you'll be a surprise how many people would be uh, would like to, to see them so this is my first boot there that I had that the first year I had a 16 inch here uh, six inches and a couple eight inches and a small four and a half inch there on the, on the table and my new orientation after that when I decided to I saw that the interest was there but my what I want, what I needed is to expand for bigger. I had uh, people asking me for larger mirror, larger telescope. So I had to kind of change my uh, my orientation of the company. So I decided to to build larger polishing machine. Uh, have a move my shop to a larger place because I couldn't I couldn't fit all the machine in, in the place. Uh, I worked with Laval University in Quebec here to help me on developing uh, my techno fusion mirror that we're going to see a little bit later on for the large mirror and how to make them affordable and as good as any other large solid mirror. I need the kiln that you saw earlier that I showed you and um, so here we go a large polishing machine made from scratch again so uh, <laughs> it was very uh, basic a plateau a turntable with an overarm and a, and a large uh, 54 point mirror cell on the machine to be able to polish and uh, figure the, the mirror on on the machine itself so it, the same thing that it would be in the telescopes so it has the machine almost all done this is the plateau with the, the, the mirror cell it's on rail because it's very heavy it's steel and it has to be movable so it's on rail here it is with the, one, one of the motor installed <coughs> excuse me and this is the tilting table that the mirror sits. This is the mirror sits on this, uh, the mirror cell here, and you will show you. I was you will see later on how it, the mirror is held in place, like this here. So I can tilt the mirror to do my measurement and then put it back uh, flat and put it back on the machine afterwards. There we go. This is a. Uh, my first 50 inch mirror that I was finishing polishing and then measuring so uh, I was quite proud and there is um, the, the, the polishing process this right now is the picture here show the grinding and I have a small video of, uh, of a polishing is the happy man here <laughs> working on a very very big mirror for the first time 
and uh, there it is the machine is finished all painted the overarm is installed that will hold the, the, the tools and sitting on the machine right now is a, a 50 inch mirror f3.5 i will explain the technology that goes into the making of this a little later on so this is a small video of the the uh, 50 inch being polished uh, here so the, over here you have a uh, the drip for the uh, the polishing slurry the overarm that moves the tools the polishing tools i built this uh this little uh timer with the pump so it will drip the liquid every minute or so so i can adjust the drip of the liquid so i don't have to always put the the the, the, the polishing liquid on it so this is the machine that you saw earlier with the 48 inch on it in the making so. i am no engineer myself but uh do it yourself it's uh, just uh, the basic turntable with an overarm but had to be strong enough to be to be able to manipulate very heavy large piece of glass there we go so this is and uh, the other machine i have a friend here that will show you a uh, different machine that works right now also for different size mirror whoops oh i, I messed up on that one we're gonna miss it so th that's when uh, i went to buy the uh, the kiln uh, for this for the shop and needed more space to, for that so we rented the the other section of the shop to, to install the kiln as you can see in the kiln there's elements on the floor on the walls in the on the ceiling so it's very very well insulated and the assembling of the kiln in the shop it's quite big and you got the car lift hydraulic lift to lift the lid of the uh, of the kiln here quite big and okay techno fusion mirror what is it <laughs> well like I said uh, I called in Laval University at one point and said I need I need your help to uh, design and, and try to produce a large optics for telescope that will be lightweight uh, fast cooling and that will be much cheaper than the uh, the uh, exotic ceramic or solid mirror that, that's on the market so we came up with the idea of i already had the idea of a sandwich mirror but uh, a few opticians had tried it in the past before i started it and the result weren't that great uh, there was all kinds of problem with them all kind of print through uh, the fusing point was wasn't as great so uh, we worked about almost three years on the on the project to achieve uh, a viable product and uh, we are very very happy of the project itself right now and it started to people are starting to talk about it and university and research group also so here's the new idea of how it's the techno fusion is built okay uh, it's borrowed silicate pyrex sheets okay that i buy and i water jet the diameter that i need could be 30 40 50 60 65 inches and the bottom the bottom plate is only in in at the beginning we were using uh, one plate at the top and one plate at the back now we do double plate on the top and single plate at the back and i get uh, water jet uh, strips of borosilicate the same material coming from from the the leftover of the sheet here uh, and i do this little columns the, the secret of the, of the well not the secret but the the, um, the advantage that we have now is that we have an interface between the post and the plates to make the weld because actually the, when it gets fused together in the kiln it, it's like it's all welded together because it, it it melts into the other one so the assembling is like just like ikea <laughs> so all the parts has to be assembled uh, before it goes in the kiln and every little column has to be epoxy on the edge so it doesn't fall and makes a domino effect when we move it so here's the 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 uh, all the the steps 
that's going to the building of the of the blank itself from the the, the 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 double plate and all the columns added to it and then to be able to manipulate the uh the 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 the, the, the blank and put it in a kiln I had to use some vacuum cups here suction cup and then, and then put it in the in the kiln and then when we, it's in the kiln we finish to assemble the columns and then we put the the, the, the back which is the top when it's in the, the oven and we fuse it together after that there it is see this one is one of the first one there's only a single plate at the top and a single plate at the bottom it works but it, it took uh, it takes more um, work to do the polishing because it's a very thin surface but it's as good as the other one. But let's see, this, this one here is uh, the 36 inch again in the kiln that's just been fused. And here he has a big one, a 61 inch. As you can see, the bottom plate, which will become the top plate of the mirror, is doubled. So we have two plates fused together, all the columns and the back plate fused together. So it, just to give you an idea, a 61 inch. Uh, we keep the ratio six to one to have to maximize the rigidity of the blank itself or the mirror. So there's no astigmatism produced by his own weight, usually with a solid mirror. But because we doing uh, uh, um, columns that in the middle, that's not a solid, we eliminate about 65% of the weight of the mirror. So instead of weighting uh, this, this 61 inch mirror would have weighed about over two tons if it would have been solid. And this one only weighed 450 pounds, only for the, that size. If you go this here, see after. So when we do the, 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 the fusing together, first it's on a flat surface, so it becomes parallel. The top and the bottom is parallel. When we do the third time in the kiln, it goes on a convex mold. And the mold is, has the radius of curvature of the mirror that we need. So let's see if we want an F3.5. We have a mold that goes in the kiln with a convex mold, and we just deposit the mirror on the top of the mold and heat up the mirror so it gets softened, and it takes the shape of the mold. So the top plate, when you turn it back uh, to, to the, it's the right, right side, the top plate has the radius of curvature, approximate radius of curvature, but it has the same thickness from the edge to the center. We, you don't have to grind the center and have a, a thinner center than the edge and gives you a problem. So that way, the mirror is all the same uh, thickness all around. And also the fact that the, it becomes a meniscus, the back is convex and the top is concave, it adds rigidity to the mirror itself, mechanically talking. So there's two advantage, lightweight, more rigidity, and because the, 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 the mirror is empty almost in the center, in the telescope we do ventilation from one side that pushes it in and the other side pushes us out, to, uh, uh, sucks the air out. So there's always an air current in between the plates, the back plate and the top plate, and keeps the mirror in equilibrium within about 20 minutes. Uh, you can keep a, 20, uh, a 60 inch mirror in equilibrium within 20 minutes. So that's a very big, big advantage for large large mirror. So here's the the first ta -da! <laughs> the first runs uh, of mirrored blanks that I've done a 61 inch. Uh, this is a, a 50 and 236 right there. So th those were the, some of the first blank that came out of the kiln. And people are saying uh, in the past well that they had big problems with print through on the figure because of the columns okay when you do a parabola and you need a, a very precise uh, figure on a mirror uh, the other optician had problem with the print through print through would be a stress at the surface of the mirror due to the column that are fused underneath the plate the top plate uh, and this is an image of a Foucault a Foucault test okay that you see right now that you get the mirror and the mirror is a parabolic right now the center is deeper than the edge so if it was, uh, if we had problem of print through, uh, you would see everywhere that was there's a column, you would see a shadow. So this is a proof, just a proof that there's no print through in the mirror at all uh, on any any zones of the mirror. So this is the the uh, the, the cherry on the Sunday. <laughs> you, you don't have the, the the print through problem that most uh, optician had with the sandwich mirror. 
So, <clears throat> so having the mirror and uh, grind it and polish, now you need it to code, uh, need to code it. So this is the small vacuum chamber that you saw earlier that do up to 22 inches. That was homemade also. And this is the big one that I built also uh, for the large mirror up to 65 inch. It took about a year to build because it was getting very um, hard for me to get a company to code the large mirror. Uh, I was doing it in uh, Pittsburgh in the past, the, the company called Flayback, uh, and uh, they, they, closed in, they closed their shop in uh, America. It was a, a German company and they closed in the U.S. So I would have had to send my big mirror to California to have them coded. It's very risky, expensive, so I decided to build my own vacuum chamber. So I, I team up with uh, electrical engineers and uh, some uh, structural engineer and uh, I told them what I wanted, what it, what it had to do, what it had to, exactly what to do, because I didn't have the half million dollar to buy it. So <laughs> I had to build it. So it took uh, six months of work of, of welding and everything and assembling. There we go. Pictures here when we build the frame to hold it. So the mirror is standing up in the vacuum chamber, and the, 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 there's a there's the back here. There's a the uh, diffusion pump, and there's a mechanical pump, and all the the uh, this side. This is the side that opens up that lowers, and then I will show you a small video on how it. Uh, this is a the 61 inch when it came out of the vacuum chamber. It will. Uh, yeah, it was success. <laughs> so they, well, we were very happy for the the first time that we coated a very very large mirror in the vacuum chamber. This is a a 30 inch mirror that came out of that same chamber. And uh, I think this is a small video. Yeah. yeah. The door opens. There we go. Oh, yeah. It's a small 30 inch. So that's fun. It's always fun when uh, you succeed something, a project like that, and that the, the, the end project is good. So uh, we are very proud. So at that point, I was only making uh, mirrors. I didn't make large telescopes. So I decided to, what the heck, why not? Let's try to do something different and make large mirror, large telescope. But I, I'm always been a, a visual observer myself. Okay, I like observing. My, I like imagers pictures on the computer, but I'm, I'm a visual person. So I like observing at the eyepiece. And uh, if you have a very big telescope, uh, let's say a 36 inch F3.5 or F4, the eyepiece ends up at about 14 feet high. And uh, it's quite scary at night to light, climb up a ladder that high. And then it's not very practical. I don't like it myself. So I decided to design the folded Newtonian. Uh, which will I'll show you a little. This is a 50-inch folded Newtonian here, installed in California. So the eyepiece for a 50-inch f3.5 folded is only at eight and a half feet high right here, instead of a 16 feet high, which would, would have been on a regular Newtonian. And why? This is the same telescope in California. The design is different. You see this. Usually you would have a 45 degree secondary mirror at the top here that brings the image here. So I lowered the secondary mirror, changed the angle, and then of course the secondary is larger, but it's no bigger than the secondary mirror that we'd have in the in the Schmidt Cosgrave telescope. No no bigger than than 28 percent. So uh, you don't get that much uh, obstruction. And because of that, I can reduce the height almost halfway at the eyepiece right down here. So see this one here, this is a 50 inch uh, with the, eye, the the focuser is at eight and a half feet high. And when I started it, I was, I'm no good in computer design. I'm no, I, I'm no, uh, I don't have CAD uh, program. So I, I designed the telescope 
uh, life size, uh, large piece of paper on the, on the floor, measured it, and then designed it on the floor, and then I get get all the aluminum parts, cut all the aluminum aluminum, and make holes. And I have a, a a good welder living nearby, and he did all my welding. So everything was made. The design was made. Uh, the the actual size that I I, I, I designed it. And if you look here, so the assembling uh, and all the parts were uh, laser cut, aluminum plates. And this here, if you can see, this is the, uh, <laughs> you, I'm standing in the telescope here. <laughs> this is the 50 inch. Uh, this is the, the cage that will uh, hold the second, the uh, focuser here and the secondary mirror will be set here. There we go. So all the parts coming from the uh, powder coating when it's all done. There we go. This is the mirror. Before I get, uh, before I coat the mirror, I always do the a test in the telescope before I do the coating, and so I don't have to redo it if there's something happen. I also do regular Newtonian for the large one, but no bigger than 30 inch. This is a 32 inch, sorry, 32 inch f3.5, a regular Newtonian out of with, a, with aluminum structure, and um, it's a it's a customer of mine in uh, Ontario. He's got seven of my telescope in his observatory. This is a roll of observatory with seven of my telescope in there. He really liked my my work. <laughs> There we go with the with the roof off. There we go, and I also do some. Uh, I I I did a few observatory roll off roof observatory for friends, uh, on in when I have free times. <laughs> and this is the observatory for a 25 inch that I built. And um, this is uh, a 36, like the one that I'm building right now for the uh, Astrolab in Megantic here. Exactly the same, the same di the dimension, uh, same, same design, exactly. And this one actually is now in Italy, uh, a customer in Italy that bought it. There we go. This is the picture that you saw earlier, Chuck, that you showed earlier. That's uh, when we did the first light of that telescope before we, we shipped it to Italy. So uh, you can see 36 inch. Uh, um, my friend here is uh, six foot and six foot one. And at the zenith, he has his two feet on the ground to look at the zenith in a 36 inch telescope. So it's, uh, it's quite amazing. So here we go. Thank you very much. That's that was my presentation. Um, I'm keep working a lot, and I always try new stuff, a new project. Like I say, uh, right now I'm working with the Toronto University. For um, I'm just going to quit my screen. Uh, stop share screen. Here we go. Working with the uh, Toronto University on satellites project to have uh, some uh, telescope up up there for uh, observing uh, um, in UV, ultraviolet. So it's very, uh, has to be done in, in space because we cannot do UV observing on the ground because of the atmosphere. So there's a project for uh, for the next year. And we're also working on, I have a, since um, last spring, last January, February, 2020, I have a new partner in the company Hugo Brunet, uh, he's, a, he's an engineer, mechanical engineer, and also works, uh, he did work a lot of projects for defense uh, related. And uh, we have big project also with Canada Defense for observatories, for space debris observation and stuff. So the big, big project coming up uh, with the, the new company is called Follon Brunet Large Optical S System, FB Loss for short. And uh, that part of the company deals with a very, very big contract uh, so far. So if anybody has question, I'm open. <laughs> well, there'll be a few, Norman. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. So, yeah. Everyone could unmute that wishes to talk. Um, I've allowed that. And so um, open for questions. I have a question. I'll start. Yeah. So uh, on your side, your side bearings uh, pieces, 
you you have a laminate in between the aluminum. Uh, is that a composite material? Uh, a it's the Russian ply. Okay. Russian ply in between the two plates of aluminum. Like uh, and, it, and, it, and it's epoxy together. Yes. And there's holes in, in the big uh, the big uh, bearings. Yes. In be in the in in between the plates, there's holes in the in the to to uh, lighten up the structure also. So it's much lighter than it looks like. The rectangle stock with the holes drilled in it that you use for your truss assemblies. Uh, do you drill the holes yourself, or do you have? Yeah, a yeah, that? yeah. Okay. Actually, actually, my 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 son and my wife helped me out a lot in there. <laughs> I have a milling, and then we do all the holes, uh, all the perforation by hand. Yes. <laughs> a lot of well, hand operation. It's, it's to lighten up the structure the, as much as possible. Yeah, I noticed you don't have to end up with a lot of counterbalance on either side. So well, that's well, well, the only uh, just to give you an idea for the uh, 50 inch telescope, uh, I only use a, a bar of uh, two by two steel, about 40, 48 inch long that I install at the base of the uh, altitude bearing. That's all. The rest is all balanced. Uh, Norman, Mitch uh, had a question earlier yep. that uh, he's muted now, but he was asking about dust control in your shop. How do you? Well, dust control is done with air. I don't have a white room. I don't have uh, each machine has a cover, plastic cover on top of it. For the, there's no dust falling down. And when there's a polishing happening or, or um, figuring happening, Everybody wears uh, uh, clean clothes and, uh, and gloves and uh, now work with masks and everything. But uh, I, like I say, I, I do what, what I have. Uh, I don't have a clean room. I don't have the money to buy a clean room or do. Uh, I don't have the money to invest in all the equipment that multi multi-millionaire company have. But like I say, I don't do 300 mirrors a month. I make maybe uh, f 10 or 20 mirrors of different size and the large one can take a, a year to build to make a mirror so every mirror is when we work on it uh, on an optics we take care of that as much as possible how do you ship this stuff it's created with a lot of uh, love <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of styrofoam and uh, impact control and uh, well insured but so far so good no accident I ship mirror all the way to Australia uh, Europe uh, it Italy uh, United States uh, South America so so far so good and usually when I when I sell a big telescope, let's say for 40 inches and up, I go on site to install it, to assemble and install it. It's part of the deal. I had to, um, do you have a nitride or a, a protective coating for your, uh, once you illuminize the mirror? Yeah, the SiO2 is, um, is dioxide uh, silica. Very good. Yeah. I have the, I had a question on yep. um, your mirrors, uh, yep. the height of the columns between the two uh, yep. pieces of glass. Yeah. Um, how is there a, a how okay. do you determine how high those should at be? At the beginning, yeah, at the beginning, we, we use the same ratio that you would use for a solid mirror, okay? Usually it's six to one. Six time the the, the 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 let's see if you have a six inch mirror the thickness is one inch if you have a 10 inch it will be a, a, a sixth of that that thickness a 12 inch would be three so uh that makes very very heavy mirror but structurally that uh speaking it's the more rigid for the solid mirror we kept that ratio at the beginnings thinking that maybe we'll keep it for and make it even stronger but we uh, noticed after uh, uh, maybe three years that we we, we did some tri trial on thinner mirror, okay? Like you saw uh, in my uh, in my walk around here, I got 40 inches mirror that are about six and a half inch thick only, uh, and because of the, the the they are so lightweight, they don't change shape because they're lightweight with that dimension, 
Okay, the structure itself is sound. Uh, let's say at uh, twelve to one. It doesn't. Ch it doesn't uh, change shape under its own weight because it's so lightweight. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's a big advantage. So on your mirror cell, um, you have you have a a, a convex. Yep. So uh, do you actually uh, jack up the outboard uh, triangles or does the cell just... The triangle themselves or the triangle themselves are floating, okay? Yes. Each triangle are floating. So it doesn't matter if it's flat like this or if it's a little... And the tilt is no bigger than the, the ratio of curvature of the mirror. So it's not it's not big. And also because of the, the fusion process, okay, the, the front part of the mirror is on the mold. But the back side, the back plate, okay, is just sitting on the post. And it because the, the glass softened, okay, when we when we do the slumping, where there's a post, there's a little bump. Okay, because the glass softened and makes a little and by having let's say 27 or 36 or 54 floating point uh, with a little pad of felt underneath, it 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 doesn't affect at all because it takes the shape. There's no, and the mirror are grinded and polished on the same cell that you would have in a telescope. Custom fit. Yeah, custom fit. Yeah, and the edge support is different than a solid mirror because you don't want a a a, a, a cable or a sling around in the post itself on the edge. Okay, if the mirror goes up, you don't want a sling underneath that goes through the post. It will push and pull on the post, the uh, the edge are held by the same principle than, let's see, uh, eight point of contact with the decentered pivot point on the edge, but each contact point touches the top and the bottom at the same, thing, same time. So you have the top and the bottom, and and it sits like this. So it doesn't touch the, 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 the post themselves, it touches just the edges. It's called a, a whiffle tree on the edge. So there's eight point of contacts that all decentered all the way, so that to uh, to uh, equalize the pressure, and the top and bottom plates are held together at the same time. And if you saw, well, you saw the picture of the Foucault test that uh, I showed in my presentation there. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was, was a 50, that. that was a 50 inch. Everything was shaped straight. No, if there would have been a pressure point at the bottom, you would have seen the shadow at the bottom. Uh, there's nothing, absolutely nothing. Uh, the mirror stay completely straight. Yeah, being lightweight helps a lot with that, I'm sure. Yeah, it does. It does. <laughs> Any more question? I just have I have one, Norman. How did you develop the expertise in designing the equipment itself? It's just uh, it's obvious. I mean, you need a turntable, you need an overarm, and just I don't I mean, know. The vacuum, the vacuum chambers. And well, the, the vacuum chamber. Well, I had some help, of course. Uh, I had some engineers that come came here and gave me advice and how to proceed. What what I needed inside the elements, the uh, the evaporation, how it has to be done, and how many, all the the the, the, the technical. I had help, but I built it here. I mean, yeah. and uh, it took it took a while. <laughs> But we were lucky. Well, lucky. I have a very, very good welder. The one that welds my structure of telescope is a very good welder. And all those parts in the vacuum chamber has to be uh, certified for weld for for vacuum chamber. Because when we do the evaporation, there's 15 tons of pressure. Okay, that wants to crush the, the entire thing. There. So it has to be, you, you cannot have a leak. You cannot <laughs> a, a crack anywhere. This has to be very, very solid. So, uh, yeah, it's, um, I don't know. I'm no engineer. I'm no, I got, I got um, teachers from university here in Montreal that comes and with their students, well, not now because of the the pandemic, but in the past, with the students to visit the shop, and they all asked me what kind of was a doctor, or what's what's your credential for what you do? I said, well, I've got grade grade eleven, and they all. 
yeah, when you have a passion and when you have a goal and you, it's not work, it's fun. I mean, I have a good time. 25 years later, I still have, I'm here the first in the morning here at seven. Sometime in summer, I'm here at six in the morning just because I like it. It's my, it's my living, it's my life. Uh, sometime my wife sees me, but I, <laughs> <laughs> she comes. She come and visit me, but I never. You see that, that to to come back to my my life story, that gave me a goal in life. Okay, uh, save me from alcohol and drugs. Save me from uh, getting bored. Uh, I'm a very active person. Uh, I never stop music. I, I I even build my own guitar. Uh, over the years, I'm I've been I do open mics uh, in Montreal. I do Zoom open mics now because uh, the COVID. But I never stop playing music. Uh, it's part of me, and I enjoy it so much now. Uh, astronomy and music it goes so well together. I, every star party that I go, I bring my guitar, and you always hear me sing a song something sometimes <laughs> in in a star party. It's uh, it's part of me. Um, so yeah, it's when th there's no problem, there's always solution when when there's uh, something happen or uh, a, mach a machine has to be built. Well, someone else can build it. Why can't I? Why can't I? Uh, well, it's just absolutely incredible what you do, <laughs> and uh, I thank you so much for joining us tonight. It was my pleasure. Thank you for I, having. I will be hitting you up again for <laughs> other organizations <Sure>. like yours. <laughs> <laughs> like I, like I, like I tell uh, Scott. Scott is a, is an indifferent uh, Scott Roberts of uh, Astro Scientific. Is is an into another market. It's not the same market than me. I'm in a very specific uh, large telescope, large mirror, custom made. Right. So I'm not a fast moving enterprise. Everything is taken care of slowly but surely. And I'm I don't compete with the big the big guys. So I said that's what I want. I didn't want to compete. Everyone asked me, why don't you start start a line of telescope and go in and, and sell them in stores and have them around the world? I said, no, that's not what I want to do. You see? <laughs> I want to do uh, unique telescopes. Like all my, I still make wooden telescopes once in a while when a customer wants one. I mean, I, I want to see an ad in Sky Telescope where you're commercially selling 100 inch telescopes. <laughs> it, will come. it will come eventually. I have the I have the kiln. I have the kiln to fuse it. If I have a customer, I'll do it. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank, thank you again, Norman. You're very, very welcome. Much. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. And hopefully it wasn't too boring. No. <laughs> <laughs> that was a, a very exciting presentation. We're, we're honored to have you as our presenter tonight. I'm sure that I'm going to, everyone will echo these, these words, which are, it was, it was very both entertaining and educational to hear your story and learn about your your uh, your your shop and uh, all that you do. Um, so with that, I'm going to um, stop the recording, but I'm going to leave the uh, um, 